And we're now going to have the sofa chat, alhamdulillah, with both our dear esteemed mashaykh. Um, I'm going to jump straight into it, inshallah, to try and keep it to the theme. So, I'd like to start with yourself, Sheikh Wahaj, if that's okay. Bismillah. If you had to pick a single point to focus on improving ourselves, and for those of us with children, to develop our children, what would it be? Bismillah wa salatu ala rasulillah wa ba'd um, Probably the most important point, self-discipline um, Most of you will probably be aware, but in case you're not There was an experiment done uh, many, many years ago um, By a psychologist in Stanford University and what he did is um, he got these little kids, uh, four years old, four and a half, five years old kids, and he placed them in a room and he put a marshmallow in front of them. And he told the kid, he says, listen, I'm going to leave the room for a while. This marshmallow is here. When I come back, if the marshmallow is still here, I'll give you two marshmallows. But if it's not here, and you've ate the marshmallow, then that's it. You just have the one marshmallow. So there there was a challenge between instant gratification, as in eat the marshmallow, or long-term rewards, meaning kind of bear the, the temptation, control yourself, discipline, and then get double the reward. So you see these little kids um, trying to avoid the temptation of eating the marshmallow you know some of them start spinning around some of them sing um, some of them try to lick the the marshmallow you know somehow trying to um, get the two marshmallows without so this is what they call a longitudinal study so they monitored these kids over time and they noticed that the kids that resisted instant gratification over time did well better uh, in their studies um, they had a higher rate of graduation they had better jobs later on they had better relationships and everything else so the conclusion from the research was from the experiment the famous marshmallow experiment is probably one of the few things that is directly linked to success um, is self-control or self-discipline and the entirety of the deen um, is about that um, and Allah Rabbul Izzah says فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى whoever fears the station of his Lord and controls the self from its whims and fancies next step Jannah so um, for ourselves best thing self-control for our kids um, the best thing you can train them in um, and be intelligent about this because potentially this you know, crazy experiments could come out of this and I don't want to be responsible for it um, is to teach your children self-discipline. Allah Rabbul Izzah grant me and you success, Ya Rabbi. Ameen. Jazakumullah. Shaykh, I heard in this study also, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a young uh, Muslim child as well, and they brought out another marshmallow and then another, and he didn't take any of them. He said because it had gelatine in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, but I don't want to take responsibility for correcting you, Habib. No, no, no. I, was, I was just joking. <laughs> Not my Jazakum business. <laughs> Allah, Allah bless you. Of course, uh, instant gratification, delayed gratification is a, is a huge quality, sabr, the, the foundation of all of uh, our good qualities. Um, Mufti Meng, uh, we heard from you earlier, Jazakum Allah, on marriage. And uh, it's funny when you're talking about the th qualities and the people fall in love uh, before they've even spent any time with each other. And when we speak to people, often I find my friends who are married and I ask them, what are they looking for in their spouse? Uh, and even the other way, you almost get like a prototype answer 
I like someone who's practicing, but not too practicing. You know, they've got to be a good person. They, you know, got to be earning well, etc. And you end up with this kind of very vanilla list of what they want. Um, what would you say if you could say of all the questions, three top questions that a person should ask their potential spouse or the family should ask when considering marriage? I think, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, one of the most important things is when you ask a question directly to the person you want to get married to, they may deceive you if they want to marry you sometimes. And a lot of the times people don't realize that. It's so easy to say, yeah, I pray five times a day and then you get married to them and they don't pray. Or I read uh, lots of Quran and they don't even know how to read the Quran. It has happened. So it's easy to say, ask the questions, but you have to know from someone who knows them. That's what we, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ speaks about knowing a person either by having lived with them. In fact, it's Umar ibn Khattab anhu who mentions uh, in a specific way about knowing someone either by living with them, traveling with them, or doing business with them. Uh, obviously, when it comes to who you're going to get married to, you would have to either communicate with people who know that person. So say for example, there is a potential spouse for a daughter of mine. I would need to contact or get hold of some of the crowd that this guy mixes with just to find out without having asked him specifically. Because you, you're going to ask someone, do you smoke? He says, no, I don't. And then when you marry him, he smokes. And then he tells you, well, I thought you were asking me about cigarettes. I just smoke weed. <laughs> And that's happening. It's happening right now. And there are people who say, well, what's wrong with weed? The whole world does weed. It's a fact. This is what's going on. It's, it's not the way. So as much as we have a list of things, it's not wrong to have a list of things to check. But how you're going to check that is what's of essence. So I've also told people, you have a list. Are you a person whom someone who ticks your list would actually be interested in? That's a very interesting one because I've had sometimes brothers and sisters say, I need a spouse like this, this, this. Some of them are prohibitive, which means it's very difficult to find a person like that. The first question I say, say for argument's sake, we found a guy, we brought him here. When he looks at you, do you think he'd be interested in you? I mean, you want a Yusuf alayhi salam. You know, you've got to also be someone who's somewhere, you know, up the lines there, man. So it's tricky, but I think it's important to check out character. When, when they're upset, when they're angered a little bit, how do they react? That says a lot about a person. You know, when, when things don't go their way, how do they react? That to me will, will tell you a lot about a person. Similarly, the issue of responsibility, are they responsible? Is this person responsible? Responsible meaning religiously obviously to begin with responsibility with their prayer with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a few other matters you know trustworthiness comes into the issue of responsibility as well and uh, and thereafter you know you look at broader character because the deen has been included you know responsibility like I said it would include as a Muslim to be a person who prays to be a person who's got a connection with Allah who's got conscious who knows what to do and when to do it and how much of it to do Allahu A'lam. May Allah make it easy. Uh, as much as we have access to millions of more people than our parents did and our grandparents did, for some strange reason, it is a million times more difficult to get married nowadays. Agreed, guys? SubhanAllah. Yeah, there it goes. Uh, Mufti uh, Pakistan. Habibi, before you say uh, anything, I figured out how to fix the mic stuff, Mufti. Yes. So we pick it up and we put it on this thing here. Mashallah. So you can sit and back. And then you sit back. And relax. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There goes. Like that. Oh, my, the wire is a little bit uh, shorter on my side. Keep pulling it, Mufti. Don't worry. It's just a little. Yeah, it's all right. There it goes. <sighs> just a round of applause for that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I had a question for Sheikh Wahaj from problem solving. I feel a bit yep. silly asking it now, but I will still ask that question, no doubt. But I do want to ask Mufti Menk yourself actually a question, continuing it slightly, because something you said was very interesting uh, about when you ask the question, the route through uh, asking the question. And I guess outside of the couple, there's often quite a few different people involved potentially in a marriage situation. And sometimes you may be asked about someone else with regards to marriage. 
in that situation, how truthful should you be? What should you do? Like, you know, we have a problem in the Ummah because I am taught when someone wants to do business with another or someone wants to marry another and they ask me for a reference, I have to be brutally honest. But the fact is, they will go and tell those people that I said this and this about them, so now it's going to be disastrous for my relation. So many people just say, please don't ask me. And they know a lot about it. So we've got a, a double-edged sword here. In reality, you're supposed to be brutally honest. And you're supposed to say, listen, I don't think it's a good idea, or I think it's a good idea. And if you don't want to worry that way, you can say, look, maybe this person might have changed, but they've been in X, Y, and Z, the last time I knew this is what happened in front of my eyes and so on or you could say look I've heard a lot I've done this I've heard so much about this person but I have never seen any of those things so best you find out from someone who might have seen it you see so that's a way of just warning them because I have found we've got so many problems in the ummah a lot of the times the parents of people who have already decided to get married they, they they're just pushing their parents into submission they're coming to you and saying what do you think of this guy they just want a rubber stamp validation for it and you know this is a disaster but unfortunately it's already happening you know a month or two later you see the couple come together they look at you they ignore you and they walk on and you know what happened because you told the father something and the father told them that you told them that in order to try and get them to break it and they didn't but then three years later they come to you and say we're not getting on. Well, I thought I told your dad that a few years ago. But so we're facing a disaster. A lot of people are not honest. When someone asks you, what do you know of this brother, you know, for, for marriage purposes, they won't say it to you because they feel that, you know, why should I tell you? But that's not Islam. But then again, when they do tell you, is it Islam to go and sell them out and, and let the people know, look, I was told this by this person. It was just an amana. So we've got to deal with both sides of that. If, I, if you want me to tell you a fact, You've got, to, you've got to protect my, the confidence here. It's like the scholars. When people used to go to the scholars with their problems, the whole village knew about what, what they were going through. So they stopped going to the scholars. So who do they go to? They go to someone else. And that's why we always tell the scholars that, you know what? Someone's come to you with problems, you dare even breathe a word at home. They shouldn't know what's gone on. That's an amana. You take it to your grave. Unless they would like you to let someone know or unless it's so dangerous and disastrous that you have to let someone know. Allahu A'lam. Jazakallah, Sheikh. Um, Sheikh Waj, the, um, in your lecture you mentioned the problem of solving abilities, how the Sahaba. And so this is why I was saying that how do you develop that ability to problem solve? Um, So one of the one of the things that as adults and as parents um, we like to do, which we shouldn't do, is we like to spoon feed our kids. Um, so we see it as a token of love if you remove a hurdle from a person's path, as opposed to letting them climb over the hurdle themselves. Um, so often you'll see um, a young kid trying to fix something, dad will walk by and say, nah sweetheart, don't do it like this here, do this like this, or let me do it for you, give me that, I'll fix it, um, and so on. Um, worse, yeah. So uh, from, the, from the seer of the Prophet wasallam, we learn the exact opposite. So Anas ibn Malik عنه, was the servant of the Prophet wasallam. Uh, for some 10 years and he says in the 10 years the Prophet ﷺ never told me do this like this and don't do this like that um, which means the Prophet ﷺ is uh, creating a safe environment for him to do what he needs to do learn what he needs to learn fall with when he needs to fall learn to climb back up when he needs to climb back up um, so that he's prepared for a better version of life. Um, so number one uh, in our problem solving is give some space for people to uh, rehearse, practice, uh, make mistakes, fall and get back up. Uh, part of that space is safety. 
so lack of input like you will know full well that that nut will not go onto that bolt so don't say it just let the guy figure it out uh, and that way they develop confidence um, in being able to um, tackle problems uh, themselves sometimes give them problems to solve um, like whether that's a logical problem, whether that's a physical problem, whether that's a mechanical problem, whether that's a family problem. Uh, I talked about consultation, like if you sit with your kids down and say, listen, uh, sweetheart, I have this business dilemma, what should I do? Like trust me, the level of maturity and problem solving ability that that will induce in the child is phenomenal. Yeah, there will be the awkwardness where he feels almost at your level, but that's just uh, that's part of upbringing and training. Um, so whatever you want the person to be good at, give them opportunities to be good and that, give them opportunities to practice. Um, and uh, my dear brother, the world is changing. What worked yesterday will not work tomorrow. Um, can I take a minute in this? Bismillah. So one of the problems that no one realizes is coming, or some people realize, is automation. Um, I was in one of the countries overseas, um, there was a man, his single job in life was to open the gate and close the gate. So I said in our country, there's a button, you click, the gate opens automatically. There's another thing that there's an attachment on my car, as I come near the gate it opens automatically, which means that job became redundant. Um, and in Australia, now trucks are self-driven. Uh, some people drive Uber. Uber currently is working very hard to make their cars driverless. Like currently they take some 27, 30 plus percent from commission from the workers. They're trying to even take that away so that they can keep all the money themselves. So there will be driverless uh, Uber cars coming through. Meaning all those in Uber will also lose their jobs sometime soon. Um, uh, even medical, uh, I saw latest, um, not latest, but a recent thing, uh, legal advice is now given by computers, uh, medical advice given by them, operations happening uh, by technology. So uh, um, think tanks predict that in the Western world, jobs will come from five days a week to four days a week. And then it will reduce to three days a week. Like that's where it will reach equilibrium. This is the forecast. And the amount of problems and anxieties and financial hurdles and social problems that will stem out of this is unpredictable. And the normal traditional ways of um, working through life will not work. So me and you have to become problem solvers, innovators for situations that we can't even see arising. Like this is a responsibility we need to communicate to our population um, that um, we need to create people with ability to see a novel problem, create a solution, entrepreneurial type of approach uh, so that they can uh, excel in the coming environment. Allah protect you. I mean, Jazakumullah. I just wanted to say actually, Sheikh, um, I, I read a lot about leadership and management styles and some of the best kind of leaders that I've worked with in in industry, they use this model where they let people fail and they know that they're going to do something wrong exactly as you're saying, the prophetic example because, because for them it's an investment in their people that it's better that they fail and they learn quickly how to fail and they stand up from it so adopting that approach with our children is, uh, is very very good and this point that you're making about the cycles of time now, it's changing, it's a lot quicker and success actually means you've got to be dynamic, you've got to be able to the person who's opening the gate, if he doesn't know how to push the button, he's not going to have that job tomorrow. And so being able to be adaptive is uh, very important in today's society. I really, really have to apologize to everyone. Whilst you guys were sat here, I got a little signal. Um, oh, Alhamdulillah, I've got the signal that we can carry on. Okay, Alhamdulillah. I take back my apology. Yeah? So, all right. Uh, don't look so happy. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Muthi, I want to ask you a question actually on this and I was going to tell everyone what the question was to whet their appetite but you can answer it. Muthi, you travel around the world, alhamdulillah, and you deal with lots of different people and lots of different levels. What was the last story that you heard that actually left you speechless though? In a good way or a bad way? Because I'm sure 
a lot of repetitive issues. But the last one that you heard that you were actually, okay, wow, even myself, this is something. I think there are so many stories that just leave you speechless and you, you realize that every day gets, should I say, worse than the previous day. You hear things that are absolutely crazy. You know, I, some of them you can't even mention them. To be honest with you, it's not worth even mentioning because it, it, it just, it's shocking where the world is heading. And that's why I firmly believe, let's take something good out of the question. Exactly. The deen that we have, the faith that we have, the rules and regulations, the values and morals that we hold, wallahi, they're a gift of Allah. They keep you clean and pure and disciplined and your mind is always alert. You know, you're a person who's real, you're there, you, you have feelings, you have a heart, you have a connection with your maker, you respect people, you try your best to, to you know, to be the best version of yourself. What more do you want? Thank Allah for that. It's really a gift of Allah. You sleep at night, you haven't wronged this one, that one. If you have, you feel uneasy until you make peace. Wallahi, the world is becoming so selfish, so selfish. It's becoming all about myself and how I can just get everything that I want now at the expense of whatever it may be. You know, very shocking, really very shocking. I've heard of a person lately who told me that they've had to do some really, really nasty things in order to get supernatural powers to be able to control some people and they just couldn't get it but they became like a sort of a witch. And they're telling you that, you know what, Allah. whatever you know from the Quran and Sunnah about this world of the unseen is absolutely true. Jalla, jalla. Absolutely true. And this person saying, help me out of this. And he, sometimes you, you can tell them how to repent, but you may not be able to really get them out of something. They've tied the knot and you don't know how to untie it for them. So it's, be it's become so unbelievable. Just thank Allah that you have a faith. Keep teaching it to the generations. Come what may. No matter what people say. What you have is of brilliant value. It's something priceless. So thank Allah for that. Jazakumullah, Sheikh. And um, I guess this is why I asked that on the positive note, the same way you know, you've heard these, and this is obviously very, very shocking uh, that someone would go to those levels. But... You must have come across inspirational people as well, mashallah, Sheikh. You know, maybe in that distant land where they have nothing but they still sacrifice. Share something with us on the positive side where you've met someone that you really remembered. Uh, a lot of the Nigerians I've met, I really remember them. And I'll sure. tell you that uh, open arms, meaning facts. Uh, you meet humble people who have <laughs> what you and I don't have. And they are so humble. And so there was a brother, I wouldn't like to say the details because he would probably listen to this. He might be listening to it live. But, uh, you know, people who have it, everything, everything you wouldn't even imagine. And when you look at them, they're just normal, simple people, more simple than you and I and more simple than you can imagine. And yet they're far, they've reached a level way beyond all of us seated here today. And you know, the, the thing that brought me to tears is when the call to prayer was called, they chopped the discussion and go to pray. Closed. The brother told me himself, please don't be offended, but when the Lord of the world is Allah. telling me, is calling me, I can't sit and talk to you, brother. Mashallah. I got to go. Mashallah. And I'm thinking, this guy is a billionaire. And it's brought him closer to Allah. I want to tell you one quick one. A brother told me that, you know, I try my best to go, uh, to, go to Umrah. This was some years ago. I try my best to, to do my Salat al-Jumu'ah whenever I can and I'm free in Mecca. Now, what would that require? It would entail a private jet, it would entail a person going, it would entail uh, perhaps a, a large amount of money, a hundred thousand, maybe more US dollars to go for Salat al Jummah and come back. So he says, a scholar told me that don't do this, you're wasting money. 
But I want to know what's your opinion because I get a lot of satisfaction and I, I'm not publicizing it. Allah put something in my mind. I, I thought of the hadith where it says, Salatun fi masjidi hadha afdalu min alfi salatin fi ma siwah illa al masjid al haram. In a nutshell, the salah in masjid al haram is worth a hundred thousand prayers elsewhere. And what did it cost? A hundred thousand. Approximate. I'm just saying. Mm. I told the brother, I said, when I drive my Toyota from my house to the masjid, the amount of fuel I use would displace my net worth by more than what the amount you're going to be using Mashallah. to go to Mecca and come back would displace from your net worth. So keep going. Mashallah. How's that? Mashallah. Because if, if I was not allowed to go, I mean imagine if a person who never ever had a vehicle looks at me and says, how could you go to the masjid by car? You're wasting so much money, you'd rather go by bicycle or walking. I mean it's relative. We've all got cars, we go. We don't even look at the five, ten pounds it costs, but for someone ten pounds is a fortune. So in the same way my ten pounds, it displaces X amount of my net worth. Uh, that particular person's that amount displaces even less. So these things have moved me because I sit and I think from all the questions in the world that this person could be asking you, they're asking you about prayer. <laughs> come on, come on, Allahu Akbar. And yet here we are, we've, we don't even have a droplet of what they have in terms of worldly life. And we're not even bothered about our prayers. Look at that. May Allah protect Allah all of us and make us strong Allah for the right Allah things. Allah I think that's a beautiful note. For us to finish on really um, yeah. to both our mashaykh here and uh, so so many lessons on a personal level how we are with each other but how we are with our lord the most high uh, and with that inshallah jazakumullah to all of yourselves uh, may allah Zawajal accept it from everyone who've come out uh, on this cold day and it's a bank holiday mm -hmm. as well to benefit yourselves inshallah you take the knowledge and you implement it in our lives in our families' lives in our community lives and inshallah the caravan continues um, inshallah the the next light upon light session will be in leicester tomorrow and then on to leeds and then harrogate and then back in london on the weekend so with that uh, we would like to bid you all a farewell assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh